So Hal has sort of made exactly the transition that we're hoping to make at this moment here, which is getting from understanding how real this is, how personal this is, how this affects people's lives, to thinking about the environments that make this possible. And so I found when I was trying to, to help Jeremy Rubin with his case and when I've been trying to help other folks at the Media Lab and elsewhere around freedom to innovate, uh, that I don't know nearly enough uh, about some of these laws that we find ourselves bumping up against. And so one of the big things that I really wanted to do uh, with this conference was bring uh, some utterly remarkable activist lawyers up to the stage to really give us a sense uh, for the world that we're dealing with and the issues that we're dealing with. And from what I understand, this is gonna be uh, at least as much a conversation as it would be a conventional panel. Uh, and let me just say that these uh, three folks are folks that you would be lucky to have a conversation with. And not only do you get to have it here before lunch, but my guess is that if you uh, buy any of them a drink or corner them later, you can have any number of conversations with them. Uh, but we have Kit Walsh uh, from the EFF, we have Andy Sellers uh, from Harvard's Berkman Center, uh, and we have Shannon Irwin uh, wonderfully uh, from the Muslim Justice League, and it just makes me so happy that the organization is named that. Uh, I, I want cartoons coming out of this as well. Uh, we have a great session here, and I'm going to hand it over first to Kit. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm looking forward to speaking with you and hearing about your ideas for how we can make change, how we can get the White House to change, Congress to change, change through the courts, and, and move from uh, defensive sort of legal strategy into really improving the legal landscape for everybody. Um, I am here from EFF, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Andy and Shannon. This is a quick overview of what is going to happen in this session as far as we can predict, and we're hoping that, that we will go off the rails and talk about some other things that interest everybody. So I'm gonna give a quick overview of um, a whole bunch of areas of law that impact the right to research and freedom to innovate and do a focus on the DMCA. Andy's going to talk a little bit about the medical devices and the DMCA work that he's been doing, then the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and maybe some resources for innovators, because the cyber law clinic is one of them. Um, and Shannon's going to talk about over-enforcement, selective enforcement issues. But we're going to start with that prompt. Uh, we're interested in hearing what your questions are, what you are looking forward to hearing about over the course of this session about the law that impacts these rights. And we're not going to answer those questions right away, but we will try to answer them over the course of our presentation and then um, to seed the following conversation with some of that content. So if anyone has ideas about what they'd like to hear from us, we're okay if you don't, we have a plan. But <laughs> uh, does, is there anything that anyone's particularly interested in hearing about? Kendra? Who is also doing DMCA work in her own right. Yeah, I'm not going to ask about the DMCA. I'd love to hear about, uh, you guys talk about unauthorized access under the CFAA and what sort of the limits of things that people think that is are, because I think that's an uh, uh, unfortunate but probably relevant topic to many people in this room. We have Other questions, one. great. Um, I'm interested, like, in a general sense, this is maybe more of a frame than, like, a specific topic, but just, like, understanding as much as we can, although it's fundamentally kind of unknowable, like, what the incentives and personal motivations are of are the people, are of the people who create these laws and also who enforce them? What, why are they doing it? So in the physical world, there are fences, uh, and there are safe places to be, like on public streets, well, people could argue, but you know, behind, behind fences which are marked no trespassing, it's more dangerous. So my question is broad, uh, but how is it that people can know where the boundaries of where they can work are? I mean, we want to push those boundaries, but how do mere mortals know where those boundaries are, where are the safe havens? Where should they really, really not go? Where the gray areas? Um, 
Shall we as a community uh, be proactive in our defense, like uh, promoting uh, like a, an insurance policy of innovation? What else we got? Great. This is my workout, by the way. Um, I have a similar question to the one previous about fences and boundaries. I'd like to hear if um, the bounding of protected computers defined by the CFAA has ever been challenged or tested in actual litigation. So my question is about, you know, how much do the laws actually matter, right? Or, or are they just so broad that people can just go after whoever, whoever they want and how much change would it take to make that no longer true? These guys can answer a lot of questions. Do we have one or two more? Awesome, Corey. Can't wait to hear this one. Well, it's a question Joey asked me this morning. Could you enumerate the whole list of risks to tinkerers legally? I came up with API copyright, DMCA 1201 liability, uh, intermediary liability, patents, uh, CFAA, and EULAs, is there like something I'm missing? Is there a sixth set of liabilities to tinkerers that you could enumerate? I love systemic questions. Mm. <laughs> uh, so could, could you speak a little bit about the non-legal risks? So just to illustrate that a little bit more, uh, by day I'm a medical student and I'm acutely interested in medical devices and the security of which, and if I were to uh, research the security and very shitty security of medical stuff, I would be at risk uh, from a professional, in inverted commas, view. That would not be sort of looked upon well by the medical establishment, and I could be at risk for non-legal reasons. Ken Kendra is good enough that she gets a second question, but then that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. Can you guys talk about the difference between civil and criminal liability for the various things you're going to talk about and how those might play into like what, you know, what outcomes might be for innovators? All right. Now, today on Ask an Attorney, we so have charged. 10. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you. So I think people know what EFF is, but um, you may not know about some of the resources that we have for innovators. Uh, on, on our website, which is EFF.org and EFF.org slash coders, there are FAQs for people who are doing reverse engineering and vulnerability research and gray hat hacking that, uh, that will address some frequently asked questions like, uh, what are the biggest risks? Where are the gray areas? How can I mitigate my risk? Um, and we also, we also advise individual um, innovators and researchers through our Coders' Rights Project, so you can get in touch with us through info at EFF.org, and we can uh, take on individual clients and represent them. We also run a network of cooperating attorneys that we will send people to to get individualized counseling, because you will not, I'm afraid, come out of this session uh, fully able to navigate the nuances of the law. We're going to sort of do our best to raise uh, raise some flags and develop some principles um, and maybe try to take a, a stab at a systematic uh, listing of some of the many laws that potentially uh, affect research. But um, speaking to an attorney is often something that is, is advisable if you're doing a high-risk research, either EFF, Cyberlaw Clinic, the BU Clinic that MIT is helping to set up, um, or other resources that maybe Andy will talk about. So this is, this is something like a list. This is the first slide of uh, a list of some laws that affect uh, researchers through the lens of work that EFF does to protect uh, right to research and freedom to innovate. We've talked about Section 1201 of the DMCA. Um, and it does matter what the law is. Uh, even if you start with an overly broad law, that's basically prosecutors go have fun, go after hackers. Uh, it can get winnowed down through, uh, through decisions in the courts, through impact litigation, um, and the DMCA, for example, actually includes a mechanism uh, for, for temporarily narrowing it, uh, which we've used to some success in the jailbreaking and cultural remix contexts. Uh, we do work with the CFA, which Andy, Andy will talk about that law. Uh, I mentioned the Coders' Rights Project. 
One thing that uh, I'm not sure if it was in Corey's list is the way that export controls affect researchers, particularly given new legal positions and new uh, suggested expansions of those regulations that would make publication to the internet equivalent to an export abroad to another country. Um, so that obviously has extreme consequences for the free speech of researchers who are trying to share knowledge or simply share the code that they've generated online. Uh, and so they're, they're, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Maybe we can get that fixed. Mm -hmm. but, um, but we've been doing some work in that context, including the seminal case back in the 90s where we helped establish that code is First Amendment protected speech. That was an export controls related case about whether you're allowed to publish encryption software. We've touched a little bit on general IP doctrines, on uh, overly broad patents, on uh, overly broad copyright regimes and copyright that lasts too long. We've done a lot of work uh, in the fair use context, helping to establish that reverse engineering uh, can be a uh, fair use and often is. Another threat to innovators, uh, often in the commercial sphere, but not necessarily, are attempts to go after the platforms where people are engaging in speech or, or gathering to associate. And so we've helped to establish and defend law that keeps those platforms uh, able to operate without being liable for everything that anyone does on that platform. So Facebook isn't liable if you defame someone using Facebook. That's not their problem. They don't have to police everything everyone does to make sure that it complies with the law. And that's actually a very important um, legal position for us to be in in order to be able to have those platforms. Uh, Hal mentioned uh, international trade agreements and the idea that the US trade representative could, uh, in principle, stop trying to export uh, hostile legal regimes to the rest of the world. Uh, the, the sort of most immediate example of that is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, PPP, which, which is in the very final stages and includes uh, a lot of bad uh, export of US law and expansion of US law, the sort of tightening of um, of the regime even at home, that, that's what we call policy laundering. When something can't get passed through the domestic Congress and then the US trade representative gets an international agreement that arguably requires the Congress to implement some law uh, to comply with it, then goes back and gets laws like, um, like the, the ban on circumvention, for example. We also run, um, an, uh, we have a new project called Offline, which is support for imprisoned technologists around the world. So people who are in uh, countries with oppressive regimes who wind up imprisoned as a result of their technological work. Uh, the, the network creates visibility, makes it a little bit harder for bad things to happen to those people for them to disappear. Um, that's, that's a non-legal support mechanism in a way that um, we can all sort of help one another uh, even if there are unjust laws that are, that are applied to researchers. So I'm not going to try to explain all of those laws. And actually there's one more, as long as we're trying to be comprehensive, um, there's uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and the Wiretap Act. So often researchers who are doing uh, network security research and, um, and sniffing packets need to worry about that and whether they have the permission of the people whose traffic is uh, traveling over that network and so on. And that's something that we talk about in our online guide, the FAQ for, um, for reverse engineering and research. And that is definitely not an exhaustive list. Uh, I, I could add infernal machines to this list uh, and, and a host of other state laws. But the reason that um, we've been hearing so much about the DMCA and the CFA is both because um, typically they, they are very broad. And so typically if someone is getting a legal threat, they're likely to be thrown in there. Uh, and there are also opportunities um, to either make some good changes to those laws, either through, uh, through the courts or through the legislature, or at the very least prevent some bad changes to those laws. So the administration has been uh, pushing a CFA reform that would increase penalties. Um, and, and that's something that maybe the White House could be dissuaded from, from backing that would be helpful in this space. So without getting into the details of, of all of the laws, we'll do a deep dive on a couple. Um, 
it's useful to, to provide a couple of big picture concepts that technologists may not um, be, be familiar with. The first one is just sort of a, a very vague normative statement, um, which is sort of meant to provoke conversation and thinking about like what are the principles that we should aim towards uh, as we are proposing um, revisions to these laws. And, and so, so treat that as something that's, that's there to provoke you into thinking of, uh, of other language and other concepts. But the also, the, another way that uh, lawyers think about uh, problems that is not always familiar to technologists is that uh, there's a spectrum of risk associated with these laws. So there's not, um, there's not a formal definition in the law of what conduct is and is not covered that actually unambiguously resolves all of the cases that arise in the world. There is language in the law that, uh, that may have been written by someone non-technical that, that may or may not matter. Um, there, there may be a definition that itself needs to be interpreted, but what you wind up with is a spectrum of risk both within each law, but also in terms of uh, what laws may be brought to bear against your conduct. So for example, one, one rule of thumb is that it's, it's riskier to try to do research um, that involves a device or network that you don't own, uh, particularly if you're not authorized to interface with it. Uh, but even if you are working with a device that you do own, that's the, the remarkable thing about the DMCA in section 1201 is that liability can attach for you working with, with hardware and even software uh, that you own. So there's a spectrum is the point there. And whenever you're operating in that gray area, you are at risk of legal bullying because uh, there, there can be an argument on the other side that what you're doing is unlawful, particularly if no court has ever decided it or the courts that have decided it govern different geographical areas than where you're engaging in the conduct, then it's very easy for someone who is upset about the, the vulnerability that you have disclosed or the, the market that you might be disrupting with your innovation uh, or simply sees an opportunity to extract some money through nuisance litigation like patent trolling, it's very easy for them to uh, force you to spend a lot of money going to court or, or back down because you may not be in a position to, to fight back legally. So I have a few ideas for, um, for how we can support innovators, researchers, and move both the law forward and provide some social support for one another. One of the things that EFF does quite a bit of is impact litigation. So what that means is when a case comes before a court, uh, and we're able to represent a client or put in a brief to inform the court and get that case to turn out the right way, that doesn't just benefit that person, it benefits everyone who's subject to the jurisdiction of that court. So this is like the, um, the Austrian emperor's prize, basically. You, are, you, have, you have taken a risk, you, you have some legal risk, um, but if you can get a, uh, a court to resolve that risk in your favor, then the prize is not only you're off the hook, um, but everyone who comes after you is now able to engage in that behavior. So that's a, that's a model of change that organizations like EFF and ACLU use to try to protect legal rights of people generally. Um, it, it, we can't just go and, and challenge laws whenever we like. Um, particularly when they involve uh, private rights. There needs to be someone actually taking that legal risk uh, who, that we can represent, take on as our client, and advance their rights. Um, so, so sometimes it's, uh, it's difficult to pursue this strategy because either the, the opposition sort of catches on to the idea that maybe they shouldn't bring these claims, or the, the penalties for being wrong are so egregious that it's, that it's really uh, painful to be a client in that situation. So that's true not only for uh, civil cases, particularly copyright, where the damages are not in any way tied to the harms that are inflicted, but particularly in a criminal case, if the downside is you might go to jail, you, you shouldn't, but there's going to be a trial and, uh, and there's no guarantee that you won't go to jail, there's a really serious um, cost to the people who are involved in making change in that way. Uh, obviously, you can change what the law is through the legislature. You can change the policies of, the, of enforcement through the executive branch, um, through Department of Justice guidelines. Those are sort of the, the more legal avenues of change. Um, 
but just events like this or, or know your rights events are ways to, uh, to dispel myths that might chill you from engaging in conduct that is arguably lawful. There may be sort of, so there are a lot of sort of rules of thumb that flow around about the law that are not necessarily um, nuanced or may reflect an especially risk averse view of the law. And so, uh, so learning your rights and, and helping your peers and others um, to know their rights is a way that we can support one another as well. Uh, institutional support, so either if you are an institution supporting your students in the ways that we've talked about, or if you're a student pressuring your institution to do that. Um, and and another, another thing that we do is just shaming companies and prosecutors who abuse the law. Uh, and it it's, can be quite effective in the context of uh, private actors who are trying to protect their reputation. They don't like that a security vulnerability has been disclosed, so they're gonna threaten the researchers. If you make a big stink about that, then sometimes they can back down if, if their interest really is reputational. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly, we already had a great introduction to this from Jonathan, so I'm just very quickly going to talk a little bit about the DMCA, but also how we got the DMCA in response to one of the questions that we got. So the DMCA was passed in 1998. And the sort of most uh, salient use case of it that would have been in people's minds is uh, a DVD that has encrypted uh, media content that um, is the kind of content that would be widely disseminated on file, file sharing sites. And so the thought was, if you uh, ban the act of cracking that encryption, that that will reduce the amount of infringing copying that goes on. Um, and so various interest groups raised a variety of objections to the, the very broad wording of the DMCA that uh, encompassed all copyrighted works and didn't seem uh, necessarily to be adequately protective of fair use rights. And so we got some carve outs that don't necessarily make sense, like the library carve out. Um, there are also carve outs for security research, encryption research, and reverse engineering. And all of them are significantly narrower than your fair use rights would be in that space. So, so it's not, they could have written in uh, a very explicit um, savings clause for fair use, saying if you're circumventing to make a fair use or to do something that's not an infringement of copyright, then that's fine. We and the courts have already said that's not a problem. You're allowed to engage in those activities with copyrighted works. But they wrote it in a way that doesn't clearly effectuate that intent and has been interpreted by most courts uh, not to allow fair uses, which is the, the single largest reason that the DMCA is such a menace to, to research and innovation is because we've thrown out the traditional safeguards for innovation, for free speech, uh, in favor of a regime where uh, circumvention is presumptively banned unless it's within one of these very narrow statutory exemptions or you engage in uh, rulemaking which you can participate in once every three years. The, the, statute, in set, the stra statute sort of recognizes, all right, this might have some adverse effect on people who want to do legitimate things with copyrighted works. So the way we're going to fix that is, once every three years, you can go and ask the Copyright Office and the Librarian of Congress to create an exemption for the subsequent three years that uh, makes it clear you are allowed to engage in, uh, in the conduct for which you applied for an exemption. And uh, so, so it's not a useless process in that we've gotten um, you know, things like jailbreaking of smartphones and once you have legal clarity around that, a market can develop, you can show the sky doesn't fall, it's actually really valuable to have these exemptions to 1201. Um, but it is a very onerous process. The Copyright Office is not as, uh, as friendly to exemptions as you would hope. And, uh, and once you get it, you have to reapply for it every three years. Um, so basically what happens every three years is the public interest organizations um, that have the bandwidth figure out how much they can do within their bandwidth and what's, what's high priority and go and ask the government for permission for people to do harmless legitimate activities. And uh, if, if, um, if approved, so typically you'll get some, either nothing or something narrower than what you ask for and then that will last for three years and then you do it again. So, so that's the, the DMCA regime. It's very much a, a sort of permission-based regime. You, you, um, the default is you need a manufacturer's permission to look at, for example, their code, even in a product that you bought, even code that for which you own that copy. So it's not 
Uh, it's not nec necessarily a, a licensing issue, which actually let's add uh, contract law and EULAs right, to the yeah. big list of, yeah. um, of legal threats to hackers. Uh, it's actually stuff that you own, but you're not allowed to look at how it works. Um, so, so this cycle, EFF is directly seeking six relating to, uh, to vehicle hacking and security research and uh, video game preservation, mobile device jailbreaking, remix, and others are seeking 21 additional exemptions, including the Cyberlaw Clinic working on medical devices, which, which Andy will talk about. Um, and excitingly, we're expecting a final rule by October 28th. Uh, so the White House only has a little bit of time to, uh, to call up the, the Department of Transportation and the EPA and ask them to stop opposing the vehicle exemptions and, and call up the, the acting librarian of Congress and, uh, and suggest that maybe security researchers and, and other tinkerers could use some more freedom to operate in this space. I'm gonna skip through. I just talked about the triennial rulemaking, and uh, I think Andy is going to uh, talk about medical devices or whatever Andy sure. wants to talk about next. Yeah, let me, let me take you through a case study of the DMCA rulemaking process through uh, the clients that the CyberLaw Clinic is representing. So we represent four different researchers that are doing four different types of research around medical devices. Um, one is doing uh, straight cybersecurity type work, so Jay Radcliffe, um, looks at uh, insulin pumps in particular and vulnerabilities in insulin uh, pumps that allow for radio frequency attacks that allow them to do things like discharge all their insulin at once um, or don't discharge any insulin ever again. Um, you know, things like that, that, you know, by virtue of being radio frequency attacks usually have to be short range. They've never actually happened in the real world and the way that they're portrayed in the season two finale of Homeland is completely wrong. Um, but the, um, but this idea that is out there that um, there are basic, uh, we were talking about this in the medical device uh, space earlier, there are basic fixes in um, insulin pumps that they could do to prevent this sort of attack that they just haven't done, like authenticating the, the signals that are coming to them. Um, another one of our clients is this guy by the name of Hugo Campos. He is a uh, cardiomyopathy uh, patient. He has a, a, an ICD implanted. Uh, in his body that uh, regulates his heartbeat and occasionally gives him uh, shocks when he needs it for atrial fibrillation. Um, his device measures an incredible amount of data about his heart's activity but does not actually share that with him uh, until he goes in for his six month checkup. Whereupon, he'll get a dispatch that says, oh, did you know that on uh, you know, February 18th at about 10 a.m., uh, you had a, a bad heart incident, your heart had a flutter. So whatever you were doing or eating on February 18th at 10 a.m., don't do that again, because that could have been really bad, that actually could have almost killed you. Um, he has had to develop a very elaborate system to track his life and his daily activity so that he can cross-reference what comes back every six months later. Meanwhile, his device every night when he's home will dispatch that information off of his device. He's figured out now, well, I could just sort of sniff the transmission that comes through and then get that data to myself that day rather than having to get these six month check-ins. Um, but there's a question about whether or not he can do that because the, the outputs of the device are encrypted. They may not be protectable under copyright as a work, by the way, which is a really interesting copyright law question, but the medical device manufacturers certainly assert that it is. Um, and there is potentially enough selection in what gets dispatched that there could be, um, but nevertheless, he's, a, he's addressing that as well. Um, Karen Sandler is another uh, one of our clients, also uh, a patient. All four of our clients are actually both researchers and patients. Um, Karen looks at, in particular, malformed code, bad code. Um, we get focused a lot on hackers on medical devices, but in fact, it's actually bad code that is what is, what is killing people today. Um, hundreds and hundreds of deaths have been attributed to um, software failures and hardware failures and interface failures on medical devices um, going back a long ways. Um, she looks at that in particular. She was placed in the situation where she needed to get a pacemaker at a very uh, young age, at about 35, and uh, wanted to know what the code was, wanted to know what the code was doing, was asking the device manufacturers, could I, could I audit the code that's going into my body, and being told no. And so is now trying to help people do reverse engineering on explanted devices to at least see the code on, on one device um, that's out there. Ben West is the fourth. Um, he looks at um, getting better data off of insulin pumps. He's been uh, dealing with 
um, actually, I should say continuous glucose monitors. He's been pioneering a lot of things around um, sharing continuous glucose monitor data with family and loved ones. Um, it's very difficult for a, uh, a patient, a child who has diabetes, to do things like go to a sleepover because their diet has to be so monitored by their parents um, for fear that they might have a, you know, a, a diabetic attack in some form. And so uh, he has been working on this idea of sharing um, continuous glucose monitoring data with parents, with siblings, with loved ones so that you can live a better life by having other people watching your health while you're off doing the things you should be doing as a kid or as a parent. Um, and so each of them confronts this from a slightly different perspective, but all are trying to get access to the source code and data outputs of personal implanted medical devices. And so that was sort of our framing is these are um, personal medical devices, implanted medical devices. We're looking to get uh, the source code and data outputs, and we're looking to get them in order to, uh, to look at the safety, security, and effectiveness of the devices is the three-word phrase that I invented about a year ago when we started doing this process um, that we've been sort of latching onto ever since. Um, this is, uh, you know, sort of this weird moment where I, was, I work a lot with students. Obviously, the Cyberlock Clinic has a, a, a small army of students that work with us. Um, but I was sort of confronted, like, sitting at my laptop one day, about a week or so before our initial petitions were due last November, and I had to sort of say, like, okay, time for me to write what might become the rule. Uh, it's a weird minute of legislation from my laptop. It was sort of like, it should be say this, and it should say at the direction of these people instead of by these people, because, of course, the patient may not be the software expert that could actually do this reverse engineering. And so there's a little bit of crafting that had to go along the way. Um, when it came time for opposition to come out in the spring, uh, we had opposition from the people you'd expect. So AdvaMed, um, which is the Medical Device Manufacturing Coalition, opposed our exemption. The National Association of Manufacturers uh, opposed our, opposition, uh, our petition. Uh, we had a couple of other um, life science people and or trade organizations come out, and we had this random guy named Jay who was really concerned. And <laughs> I don't want to belittle Jay. I later researched and found out that Jay, in fact, works uh, for one of the medical device companies, so I figured out why Jay was so concerned. Um, but uh, it was amazing because this is supposed to be a copyright thing, right? Our concern is piracy. And in the case of medical devices, we don't have the piracy concern, right? No amount of access to the source code of a defibrillator is going to replace the need for the defibrillator, right? It's exactly why it is useful is why it is needed. You can't actually have a piracy problem in this space. Um, and none of the exemptions said anything about copyright. They didn't say it at all. Um, their concern was, of course, um, the sort of general fear, uncertainty, and doubt. These people don't know what they're doing. They're going to screw this up. Patients can't understand this data, which when you talk to a patient like Hugo, who is now like in residence at Stanford because he just became so invested in this that he started researching and researching and researching, never stopped and became an expert, like that's insulting to someone like Hugo who, who studies this stuff um, so deeply. And so they kind of tried to paint all of this fear and uncertainty around it. Well, the advantage that we had is that their, um, their security on these devices was so bad up to this point that many of these devices had no technological protections measures on them whatsoever, which meant that this research had actually been happening for a long period of time. And we could point to a history of this research being done and not only helping to save lives, and there are folks like Kevin Fu who has done this and has launched his whole career around security of medical devices, but we could actually show the FDA and the Department of Homeland Security and others citing these pieces of independent research when they were actually regulating the safety of these devices. So our, our, our response was two-pronged. One is that the Copyright Office isn't really in, in a good situation to gauge safety and security. The FDA is, and the FDA relies on this research. So you are actually going to cut off a source of information for the government to regulate if you prevent this sort of research from happening. Because of course in situations like uh, malformed code, it doesn't matter how obscure it is. If the code is bad, the code is bad. And, uh, and we need to find out because we need to make the code good. Um, so I feel pretty confident that we made a good argument there. I will find out on October 28th how good we were. Um, but it, it has been uh, an amazing thing for me because I came to this originally from a copyright background. When I was in law school, I thought I wanted to be a music lawyer. And so I mainly focused on copyright and I learned as much as I could. I have had to cite so little copyright law in the DMCA proceeding. 
it is a bit crazy. In fact, mainly what I'm citing is facts, right? What I'm mainly citing is don't be afraid. In fact, this is good research. And if there are concerns about disclosure, there's a robust ethical uh, considerations that already exist. There are norms in this culture as to how to share this information and where, and here's all this good evidence of people doing the right thing. Um, we are so far beyond the anti-piracy concerns that started the DMCA um, that we're regulating things like emissions uh, through this. We're, we're trying to, to opine on matters of health where we're really kind of really far afield of what this was originally designed to do. Um, so uh, it is the, the problem of overbroad laws is something that we've talked about a few times. And I know, Shannon, you're going to talk about overbroad laws as well. Um, but it is that concern. It, it's, it's what Starr mentioned earlier, this sort of disorderly conduct charge, which no one can really ascertain what it means or what it does, but it applies nevertheless. It leads to this concern that um, Robert Jackson, who uh, was at one point the Attorney General of the United States, later became Justice Jackson, um, wrote about uh, when he wrote an essay called The Federal Prosecutor, and he was concerned about these overbroad laws, meaning that the prosecutors are no longer going after laws, they were going after people. It's that same sort of feeling, that same sort of fear. And we in the, the, the computer world, in, in the technology world, are seeing a slice of what has been true for so many other types of people um, for so, so long. Um, Robert Jackson wrote about that concern in 1940, and it could go back easily two centuries before that. Um, you can find similar inklings and notions. Um, so anyway, I'm a little far afield. Um, but, um, so the DMCA has this problem. The, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act has the same problem. I could go through today and talk about the either seven or 13, depending how you count them, different uh, crimes that are within the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But they all hinge around this common idea, and it's already come up a couple times, and it's this question of authorization. So for example, if you, uh, in, you uh, enter into a computer, and query for a second what that exactly means, you enter in a computer and you obtain information from that computer, and you did so without authorization, that's pretty much all you need for one species of a CFAA violation. If you knowingly inject code and your code causes damage and loss, even if you did not intend it to do so, that's another way that you can have a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act problem. There's a few others as well. But this question of authorization, which is obviously pivotal to CFAA, is so radically under-theorized. And I think you know, there, there's been some interesting literature about it. Oren Kerr writes about this all the time. His most recent essay uh, is calling back to norms to define the space which I think works, we were talking about fences and trespass. We have a sense of what that means, though we still get Supreme Court cases about walking do police dogs up to the fence and whether or not that, in fact, is uh, a trespass in that sense or not. Um, but we kind of get what it means in the physical world because we have millennia of experience. We are so new to this space, we don't know what that exactly means. And, and Kerr posits a theory of what he thinks it should mean. Uh, and as a person who went to GW and studied under Oren Kerr, I'm inclined to agree with much of what he says. But um, you know, he posits his worldview. And I think that when we, if we were to poll the room, we'd probably get many different worldviews. Questions like, um, is it true that any URL that's publicly accessible should be retrievable if you enter in that URL? Um, I think so. Kerr also agrees with me there. Um, but it's that same notion, I think, if you were to ask AT&T, uh, they would say no. And in fact, Kit and I worked on a brief in the uh, case that I'm sort of circling around, the United States versus Ornheimer case, about exactly that notion as a matter of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, if you think about, for example, uh, you go to Voltage down the road here, and you want to get on their Wi-Fi, and you don't know the password because it's hidden somewhere, so you go online on your phone, and you find it, and you find the password, and then you type in the password, and you get online. You have done password guessing. We have a case on point, in fact, involves a, a man who's now a professor here at this institution um, that, that, uh, that says that that is a CFA violation, but it feels so benign, it feels so common. It's something that I think all of us have probably done at some point. I will admit I have done that before, um, in case Carmen Ortiz is listening. Um, but the, um, it, it feels like it should not be a crime because it feels so common. And, and maybe if you ask Voltage Cafe, they feel differently about it, right? And so there's a lot of uncertainty in the space, which means that um, when folks like Berkeley recently published a white paper uh, at the Berkeley School of Information and the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology talking about the legal impediments to cybersecurity research, they found themselves going to soft power. They found themselves going to private ordering, this notion of the contracting we do around these 
institutions as places where the real action often is. It becomes a political fight because the law is so uncertain, which means that as lawyers, we have a dual obligation. We have an obligation not only to say, here's our best understanding of where the law is today, here are some potential vectors of where it might go tomorrow, but also you should think about the political ramifications of this. You should think about the ethical considerations of this. Um, we have this idea, John mentioned it last week, Jonathan mentioned this idea of wise counsel, which I think is a really nice way of thinking about what a, a technology lawyer's job is in the space, a person who is one degree removed from the activity, so can maybe get a sense of what it looks like from the other side of the wall, um, but at the same time has your back, has your support, um, or ha is supporting you, and is out there to do the things that you want to do. Um, so. I didn't actually tell you anything about the substance of the CFAA. I hope that's okay. I'll happy to take one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, but I actually would like, love to turn it over to Shannon and talk a little bit about this idea of broad laws because I think Shannon's work sees this better than, than either of us. Great. Thank you so much, Andy. And um, I'm, wow, I was able to operate the mic, which surprises me because I am certain that I am the least tech-savvy person in the room right now. Um, my name is Shannon Irwin, and I am an attorney and executive director of the Muslim Justice League. We're a very new organization formed last year um, in order to advocate for human and civil rights that are being violated under the war on terror. So for rights that are being uh, eroded for national security, supposed national security reasons. Um, one of the programs that was really the impetus for our founding is called Countering Violent Extremism, or CVE, which is... Um, quite a case in point of, of overbroad uh, and selective, not necessarily prosecution, but chilling of viewpoints, and I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, when I was asked initially to speak on this panel, I was really excited um, and intrigued because the parallels between our work uh, at the Muslim Justice League and the work of uh, tinkerers and innovators were honestly not something that I had given much thought to. Um, and yet, in starting to speak with Andy and Kit, about their work, I, I recognize that uh, there are so many parallels, and specifically one area in terms of overbroad and selective prosecution. A theme is you know, state authorities in the case of national security laws, but I think it could also be powerful private interests, certainly um, in the case of freedom to innovate, seeking to discredit or, or marginalize or chill or criminalize um, oppositional speech, uh, awareness raising that is threatening to their interests. Right, and so I was asked to speak specifically about material support prosecutions because that's what most directly impacts our Muslim communities right now in terms of overbroad prosecutions. Um, and so to give a little bit of background on the material support statute, since 1996 there has been a uh, criminal law against providing funds, uh, goods, material, personnel, training, or expert advice or assistance, the latter part actually added under the Patriot Act, um, to terrorist organizations, and it's any organization that our Secretary of State designates uh, a terrorist organization. Um, that may sound somewhat innocuous, but when you think about it applied in practice, what exactly is, in particular, expert advice or support, right? So there was a case, Humanitarian Law Project versus Holder. I don't know how many lawyers are in the room uh, who are aware of this case, but this is a very important case for understanding just how broad the material support statute uh, can be. Before that, I'm just going to briefly flag, and my apologies if this is basic for anyone in the room, but another critical uh, First Amendment case, which was Brandenburg versus Ohio, 1969, where the Supreme Court said that it is not constitutional to prescribe um, advocacy uh, for violent methods. Um, there's an exception for if you are actually advocating in a way that is likely to provoke imminent unlawful action, but just advocating the use of force or advocating violence is uh, protected First Amendment speech under Brandenburg. Um, enter Humanitarian Law Project versus Holder, which is not about advocacy for violence, but rather about uh, an organization, the Humanitarian Law Project, and another, some other organizations that uh, wanted to provide support to Tamil Tigers. Um, the Humanitarian Law Project wanted to support the Kurdish, Kurdish Workers Party, the PKK and specifically not to help them uh, commit violence because they are a designated terrorist organization, but rather to help them explore lawful and peaceful means to advocate and to resolve disputes, um, and also to do some human rights monitoring of uh, Kurdish areas in Turkey. So these, these organizations, Humanitarian Law Project, um, and the organizations that wanted to provide similar peaceful assistance to uh, Tamil groups, 
asked for uh, a determination of whether or not their activities would be prescribed by the material support statute. And the Supreme Court ruled that they would be. The Supreme Court ruled uh, that even the provision of legal advice or assistance would be prescribed by the material support statute, which seems frighteningly broad to me. You know, when I think about the implications of, you know, for, for national peace, international peace and security, of telling human rights groups, legal advocates, that you are not allowed to promote peaceful methods? What sort of uh, remaining channels are there for folks who legitimately want to affect change um, in situations of human rights abuses? But even the Humanitarian Law Project case was not as broad or as frightening as the landscape that we find ourselves in now. Because the Humanitarian Law Project Court did specifically say that, you know, although we are finding that these particular activities would be unlawful under the material support statute, we note that they, uh, these activities would be done in coordination with or under the direction, under, uh, under the direction of a, a listed terrorist organization. And the, the court specifically said um, that independent advocacy could not be constitutionally criminalized, um, consistent with our First Amendment protections. So they made that statement, and yet we find ourselves today in a different place. Um, the material support statute has been used, its, its use has escalated since 9-11. There were only six cases where it was used before 9-11, although it was in existence since 1996. Um, and there were almost 100 cases in the, in the three years after, or excuse me, the six years after that. Um, there have been about 500 cases, more than 500, 500 between 9-11 and 2011 of national security or counterterrorism related prosecutions, a large portion of which rely on the material support statute. So one crucial case that I wanted to discuss happened here in Massachusetts, and that was the prosecution of Tarek Mahana. Um, Tarek Mahana was uh, from Sudbury, Massachusetts. He was a pharmacist. He was Muslim. And like many Muslims and many people who are paying attention to foreign policy, he had a lot of objections to uh, American imperialist ventures. He had a strong objections to the war in Iraq. And he advocated that Muslims have a right to self-defense um, in areas where they are under occupation, such as Iraq. Um, in terms of his actual activities, he would uh, caption so-called jihadi videos. Um, he also translated a document called 39 Ways to Support or Participate in Jihad, which actually talked about nonviolent methods to engage in jihad, which is a, a Muslim principle, meaning struggle. Um, it does not necessarily connote violence. Uh, it can connote self-defense, but it can connote a lot of peaceful things as well. Um, but one thing that was crucial in his case was he refused to be an FBI informant. So, Mahana, like many young Muslims, was visited by the FBI. Um, he was told that you know, he was invited or, or encouraged or coerced to become an informant. He was told at one point, according to his recollection uh, by FBI agents, we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. If we do it the easy way, you'll never see the inside of a cell. Meaning, if you work with us, if you act as an informant, we will not prosecute you. Um, for basically some false statements that he had, in fact, made to the FBI, um, but also for material support. He refused to act as an FBI informant. And so our, uh, our US Attorney's Office in Massachusetts prosecuted him for some false statements to the FBI, but also for material support on a couple of bases. One was they alleged that he had, uh, he had in fact gone to Yemen in 2004, and he said that that was for learning Arabic and religious instruction. The federal government, the federal prosecutors, alleged that he went there to try to join a terrorist training camp, which he denied. Um, and the other basis was that they said that he had um, supported terrorism, uh, supported Al-Qaeda specifically by acting effectively, in his own view, as a media promoter of Al-Qaeda's views by his captioning these videos and, and by his translating this document, 39 Ways to Support or Participate in Jihad, which had been translated many, many times. Um, it was already widely available online. Um, and the prosecution really played up the idea that Mahana was dangerous because of this theory of radicalization, that his putting his viewpoints out there, his sharing information, his sharing outrage at American foreign policy could radicalize other Muslims to become violent. There was no evidence and no attempt to show that his activities were done in coordination with Al-Qaeda or any other designated terrorist group. 
And that's really key if we think back to humanitarian law project versus Holder, right? That was explicitly a requirement um, of speech being criminalized under the material support statute. Nevertheless, Tarek Mahana was convicted. Uh, it was unclear from the jury decision whether he was convicted on the basis, of, in terms of the material support uh, count on the basis of his travel to Yemen or the, uh, the translation of documents. Um, it almost wasn't even asked publicly that question because when it comes to terrorism cases, I think the prosecution is given very wide leeway. Um, that's not surprising given the climate of fear that we find ourselves in, right? And he was sentenced to 17 and a half years. So since that time, we've continued to see, uh, in, in federal prison and supermax prison, right? Solitary confinement. Since that time, we've continued to see a number of uh, material support prosecutions. I, um, I don't know exact data on whether they are increasing, but I, I suspect that they are. I wouldn't be surprised if they are. We're certainly reading a lot about cases of youth being charged with con conspiracy to provide material support because they buy a plane ticket to Turkey, right? And they are alleged to be uh, planning to fight with ISIS. Um, and in many cases, those prosecutions are supported, propped up by evidence of online social media use. If somebody expresses outrage about foreign policy, if someone, uh, certainly if someone expresses support of ISIS, that is used as sort of evidence that they were intending to provide material support by joining ISIS. Um, and so all of this, uh, this broad prosecution of what otherwise has been to date protected, First Amendment protected speech, um, and selective prosecution specifically as a, of a suspect community, of Muslim communities in, in our case, uh, I think has a lot of parallels with what you're seeing in terms of um, prosecution of tinkers and folks who are trying to innovate. And it's not only those two groups either. We see under this, this so-called countering violent extremism program that other groups that are likely to be targeted include environmental activists, um, including uh, also people who challenge capitalism, the tenets of capitalism in any way. Um, those folks are likely to find themselves in the, um, in the spotlight of a countering violent extremism program, which ostensibly seeks to prevent people from becoming radicalized to terrorism. Um, but it relies on these debunked theories that ideology is correlated with political violence, which all the empirical evidence shows is not the case. Um, you, there are plenty of so-called extreme or radical ideologies or people who hold those ideologies and never commit violence and there's not actually a correlation. But this is a convenient, I think, uh, theory and it's been around since about 2005 um, when there were a couple of terrorist attacks in Europe and also when the insurgency in Iraq was really problematic for Western powers in Iraq. Um, these are convenient theories and I think this gets to a question that somebody asked, I forgot who, but about the motivations for these statutes and these prosecutions. Um, and what we're seeing both in the use of the material support statute to criminalize speech, to criminalize advocacy and awareness raising and information sharing, I think is that there is a motivation of silencing criticism of certain American policies. Um, certainly it sounds like in the tech world there is a, uh, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but <laughs> uh, an intent to silence um, uh, criticism of unsecure uh, platforms or, or um, you know, any vulnerabilities that could hurt a bottom line, perhaps. Um, and these are really concerning effects that we're seeing in terms of chilling speech as well. I hear from many Muslim parents and Muslim youth, how do I know what it's safe to say online? How do I know, you know, is it okay to talk about being concerned for folks in Syria. Um, many parents want their kids not to use social media at all because they're terrified that they will be at risk of prosecution. And it's hard for me to think that that is fully unintentional, that that is an unintentional consequence of this extremely overbroad and selective prosecution. Ultimately, I think uh, the folks who have created these laws, interpreted these laws, and prosecuted uh, selectively under these laws, in some cases would like to see less of that oppositional speech, less foreign policy criticism. But ultimately, that is going to uh, have a very negative effect on our society in terms of um, taking away the, the free public debate that we really need to have if we're to arrive at peaceful, lasting solutions for the conflicts that we're seeing. The conflicts that ostensibly these laws want to address, right? But we're, we're driving dissent underground through these methods. Um, so to end with something very, um, 
I mean, in contrast, slightly hopeful. I guess I would talk about a couple of, a couple of possible channels uh, for change that we see. At the Muslim Justice League, we really see change needing to come from the grassroots. Not only the grassroots, certainly legal advocacy, policy advocacy is crucial, and as a lawyer, I have a little bias in that area. But we also know that uh, policymakers, prosecutors, are not going to um, take their marching orders from lawyers alone and advocates alone. If they can secure the participation of grassroots communities in these programs such as countering violent extremism, which to explain a little bit further, inserts surveillance into the social services sector, the education sector, and basically asks Muslims to spy on other Muslims, asks uh, teachers to spy on students, healthcare providers to spy on their patients, um, and unnecessarily and, and wrongfully designates certain viewpoints as being indicators of future violence in contrast to the scientific evidence that's out there. If prosecutors and other organizations, and it is the Department of Justice that is leading this program, by the way, primarily in Massachusetts, um, if they can secure the participation of grassroots community organizations and faith-based institutions, they don't, it doesn't really matter to them what the attorneys are saying. Right? So for that reason, we think that um, increasing awareness and increasing grassroots advocacy is really important. And there's a campaign in the UK called Students Not Suspects, which is very inspirational for me. Um, the National Union of Students and the Universities and Colleges Union have come together and said, we will not participate in uh, the UK's um, sister program of CVE is called PREVENT, short for Preventing Violent Extremism, and it's now been legislatively mandated that teachers participate in healthcare providers and others. And they have actually said, we object, we will not spy on our students, we will not engage in this racial and religious profiling endeavor. Um, and I think that that's very powerful. If the, the people who are most directly impacted recognize that this sort of overbroad criminalization of speech and information sharing is contrary to their mission of promoting dialogue on university campuses. Um, I think that they are some of the best, the people best positions to push back. And so I think uh, I've probably spoken enough before we turn over to a more conversational format. Yeah. And, uh, and so we'll take some more questions in a minute. I don't think we fully addressed uh, Kendra's question about the difference between uh, civil and criminal causes of action. So maybe we could take just a second to do that. So for people who are not as familiar with the justice system as lawyers have to be, um, civil causes of action allow private parties to sue one another. And so um, as opposed to criminal causes of, of action or um, bases of prosecution, under which the government can prosecute you to potentially put you in jail or fine you um, under a different set of procedures. So both the DMCA and the CFA have uh, civil as well as criminal components or causes of action. So in the case of, uh, of the DMCA, if you do the conduct uh, commercially and willfully, then it can escalate to uh, criminal violation. Sometimes that's not a problem for, for researchers because you're not doing it commercially, but it may be a problem for innovators if, if, um, uh, if you are. Uh, the CFAA uh, also has both civil and, and criminal causes of action. Um, and, and two major differences uh, you know, sort of across the board for criminal and civil are in a criminal uh, case, you can be put in jail in addition to, to the financial harms. And so the, the penalties are potentially much harsher. Uh, there are different procedural protections in part because you may be put in jail, but also the way that the statutes are interpreted uh, may be a little bit narrower, again, because uh, you need to be uh, put adequately on notice of your rights uh, before you can be uh, punished and the adequacy of that notice varies slightly depending on whether the punishment is imprisonment or um, or financial. Uh, in the civil context, one of the interesting differences is that uh, it is possible for prosecutorial discretion to manifest as restraint. It's possible if an agency is responsible for enforcing something that they might uh, not be interested in enforcing something, particularly if it only implicates uh, a company's private interests. So if you turn something that is a public cause of action into a private cause of action, a civil cause of action, uh, you can, in some cases, enable more anti-competitive behavior. So this is something that we've seen in the vehicle-related exemptions where the uh, automakers say, look, there's this EPA regulation that 
bans some of the conduct that people might theoretically engage in if they circumvented equipment. Um, and one of the responses is, well, yes, and the EPA will determine whom it makes sense to pursue under, under that cause of action, not a manufacturer that has an interest in locking down the aftermarket for, for uh, competitive reasons. So anything anybody else wants to talk about in terms of civil and criminal? You know, the, the thing, I, I, when I'm, I'm thinking about this space and I'm thinking about um, this new BUMIT clinic that, that's thinking about launching, and I think about actually, um, it's already come up a couple times now, which is the First Amendment. Hal sort of alluded to it when he talked about hacking as a religion. We talked about it in the, in the Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project case. But I think about the tradition of the First Amendment and the free dissemination of even scary ideas, and I think about journalism. Um, I just want to quickly flag, Frank Lamont is here from the Student Press Law Center, um, who's been doing incredible work with student press for many, many, many years. This organization is just truly incredible in terms of the way that they've been able to foster journalism on campus, even journalism that is critical of the institutions in which they are housed, sometimes actually funded and housed. Um, and the history of the First Amendment's push in the journalism space has been a, um, a push mainly in civil realm because the idea of criminal only gets raised in the very scariest of times, right? It's the Pentagon Papers, right? It's the couple of times it was suggested in maybe one affidavit or one uh, filing in one case, and all of a sudden the, the press just seizes upon it and throws it um, back at the administration until they apologize and capitulate. Um, we're in a different space in that respect because so much of what's going on here is criminal. And the risks that a journalism institution can take, which A, back in this area was extremely well funded, and also was facing at most money damages and loss are a different calibration of risk than uh, a student which has neither the money nor uh, necessarily facing only a, a civil charge instead of a criminal charge. That puts a lot more pressure on us. But the advantage of these laws is are that they are both civil and criminal. And so whenever there's a civil lawsuit that starts to percolate in either space, I think organizations that are interested in impact litigation probably would like to talk to you because the ability to move the law in those spaces is a lot um, more palatable than it would be in the criminal space. So we've got time for a few questions here. If folks have uh, any unanswered questions after our opening 10 questions uh, <laughs> and the excellent attempts uh, by the attorneys on the panel to answer them, if anyone has stuff to bring up, I knew Earhart would have stuff to bring up, uh, please introduce yourself before asking your question. Hi, my name's Earhart. I'm here at the Center for Civic Media at MIT. Um, Shannon, you were talking about this kind of the ways that you have this overbroad uh, interpretation of the laws that end up uh, basically making everybody complicit into the practice um, and protection of those laws. And I'm curious about how that may have been manifested in some of the technology laws that we have now. Do we see ways that you know, we are getting innocent bystanders swept up by these broad nets of the, of the technology um, laws that you're describing? You know, are there ways in which you know, we, are, we might be supporting or advocating for our friends that are working on this stuff? and thus become culpable or liable in certain ways. And I'm curious about the, the state of the law and, and, and how that affects the, what we should be doing for, for our fellow students. I don't know that I can speak to that in the, in the tech realm so well um, in terms of people. I, I, so, yeah, in, in the context of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, you have liability both for the act of circumvention but also for disseminating uh, tools, and sometimes that's considered even knowledge about how to effectuate that circumvention. Um, so, so in terms of infectious liability, uh, it's, it's certainly the, um, the theory of the entertainment industry that uh, people who are discussing ways of circumventing access controls on copyrighted works are potentially themselves now violating um, the DMCA's ban on circumvention. Uh, that obviously has even more significant First Amendment concerns than the basic ban on circumvention does. Uh, so that, that's something that uh, I think the entertainment industry is shy about asserting because if we got it before a court, there's a good chance that that gray area would be resolved in a direction that would narrow their ability to, uh, to intimidate through the law. Um, in terms of, uh, Andy, did you come up with any other uh, areas of law while I was talking about the DMCA? Uh, I want to echo the um, ECPA, part yeah. of the Electronic Communications and Privacy Act, which involves a lot of, it comes into play when you're dealing with real-time interception of data, but I also want to flag there are a lot of these general criminal laws in both state and federal law 
Uh, we mentioned disorderly conduct already. Wire fraud is just this very, very, very broad law that has this huge criminal penalty potentially behind it. And it can come up in almost any of these cases because the idea is that you're going to take something from someone and you're going to use electricity in doing it. That's kind of all you really need in order to start your way towards a wire fraud prosecution. Um, and so the mail fraud has a very similar idea except using paper. Um, and not necessarily paper, actually, in mail fraud. So um, it can get really complicated. So there, there are these sort of add-on crimes um, that I know came up in the context of the Swartz prosecution, because Aaron Swartz was also charged with wire fraud amongst the other crimes he was charged with. Um, and it's sort of, it's been raising this question that I think is definitely far beyond our community. It touches the whole criminal justice system, right? When I was trying to understand what happened in the Aaron Swartz case, I looked first to the CFAA, and I tried to understand what happened there. I found myself by the end reading literature by folks like Bill Stuntz, former uh, uh, professor at Harvard Law, died just very recently, and he talks a lot about the collapse of American criminal justice. I think that's the title of his book. And he talks about this idea of this um, complicity and this inability for us to recognize um, how broader laws have gotten, how much discretion is given to prosecutors, and also what happens to a person once they go to prison. We don't talk about prisons in this country, despite it being such a huge part of the criminal system. Um, and we need to recognize just what it is we're doing to people when we're charging with a criminal law, and we need to be vocal as bystanders, as people who are uh, related or um, potentially affected secondarily in addition to you know, thinking about our liability in the space. I think we need to, we, it's, it's on us to signal to the mechanisms of power that this is like the activity that we're seeing targeted today is not wrong, and it is not scary, and it should not be a crime, and it should not be a crime for which we put people through one of the worst human experiences we put people through, which is prison. <laughs> Quickly, because I was hoping uh, that you might have examples about where there were expectations that we police ourselves or police the people that we work with. Um, because in the case of, of like MIT, you know, is there a reason maybe legally where they're not acting because they don't want to admit any sort of liability and kind of some sort of expectation of, of policing their community? Well, so one of the reasons why institutions don't get directly involved with cases against uh, their uh, employees or students at the institution is because uh, they might have some kind of, uh, of control over that employee. There might be some layer of direction of what that employee does that uh, potentially raises the possibility that both the individual and the institution will wind up being defendants. And so MIT's lawyers, the general counsel, represent MIT and uh, ethically if there were a, a difference in the interests or a potential difference in the interests between the individual and the institution, they simply might not be able to, to take on the representation of the student directly, which is why it's good to have some kind of level of separation between the general counsel and an outside clinic or outside attorneys who really are focused on the interests of the individual and can advance them, even if it winds up being detrimental to the institution. Uh, there was some talk of, of carve-outs in, in various laws. It, it, I know the EFF publicizes winning cases, but is there a list of like things that people definitely can do? Okay, he or she just did this, and therefore I can too. So, it, okay. Yeah, just, uh, it's hard to craft such a list because you, we, you know, in, in copyright certainly there's this idea, this notion that comes from a few different scholars about tolerated uses that uses that are on the edge that, that may or may not be legal, may or may not be a fair use, but are nevertheless tolerated. So anytime you have a, a person who does something and does not get sued or gets sued in one, it can often be difficult to advise. But that is, in fact, what lawyers do, is they look to precedent to try and navigate a path. I don't know if there's a particular area um, where I'd say sure shot would do it, and I definitely wouldn't say that here, because I fear <laughs> what might, someone might do get in trouble and then go after me. Um, but the, um, I would say that the notion of access and authorization in some jurisdictions is actually much better than others. So the Ninth Circuit um, in California and most of the West Coast is, is gone a lot further than a lot of other jurisdictions and actually thinking about, well, this can't just mean norm, normative access, because then we can't really have a, an effective criminal law. No one will know what's a crime or not. It can't just be a contract either, because you know, just reading the statute, that shouldn't just be how these norms are set. It really should be more of a code-based circumvention in order to trigger the CFAA. Um, we just don't have those cases yet in Massachusetts. We, we, despite the a men, a tremendous amount of technology here, there haven't been enough CFAA cases for us to really chart that landscape yet. 
don't know if you can talk more about Ninth Circuit life. Californian. Right. right. I think um, if you look at the sort of FAQ that we have for people doing reverse engineering and security research, you'll see um, that there's sort of bullet lists of this is high risk activity. So this is activity where there's maybe been a court case that came out in a way that's hostile to research, or maybe you know, there hasn't been, but, but the, the trend is in that direction. And then there will be a bullet list of these are things that you can do uh, to reduce your risk. But in terms of, um, of, of saying, you know, here's the menu of things that have no legal risk, that's, that's not something that's, that's realistic to do. And uh, if you tried, it would have little subheadings for, well, are you in the Ninth Circuit? Are you on the West Coast or, or are you not? Um, which, to, just to illustrate, this is the, the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit. These just happen to be the, the circuits that have uh, judged that the DMCA doesn't allow for fair uses. Um, so you would basically have a little interactive guide, maybe where are you? Well, what's the law right now where you are? And that's, uh, rather than sort of creating an all pr a general purpose guide, when you have that level of, of um, immediacy or curiosity, that's when you talk to a lawyer and hopefully they have these sorts of maps and knowledge uh, in their head and will listen to the facts of your specific situation and try to map it onto what's come before. So we've probably got space for about two more questions, and please keep in mind that these lovely individuals are gonna be around for the rest of the day, and so if you don't get the answer here, you can corner them over lunch. Um, I'm sorry to sort of double down on the thing I said before, but I just really wanna hear your opinions about this, which is that, uh, I mean, I know uh, you guys are very legally involved, and so we're hearing about the um, attempts, to, uh, the philosophy and the attempts to fix these laws that, and highlight the problems with them that are allowing these prosecutors to mess up people's lives. Um, and that's clearly crucial to understand and work on, but it also has a little bit of a Band-Aid-y feeling because it's like, to, to me, looking at it as a social system, like the core problem is that there are these assholes who are getting paid by the government to do this. And so um, I'm curious about like what ideas you all have or someone else has that you can refer to about ways to change this culture and this incentive system for these people um, because like if you if we can't change it then like there, there I mean there's always going to be more holes to plug legally right um, and of course there's also the legislative question but like you know we can't just yeah so the, the, the initial question if I remember correctly was basically a question about motivation uh, and a sense for what motivates the prosecutions going on here. Uh, and I realize in some ways that takes you guys sort of out of your comfort zones because you're more likely to deal with the matters of the litigation. But I actually think it would be very helpful um, to the extent that you're willing to go out on a limb a little bit and sort of speculate about why we find ourselves in this scenario again and again. Do you want me to start? Sure. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to make broad generalizations about anyone's motivations. Um, but I think I already touched a little bit about what I suspect the the drivers of these overbroad uh, statutes and prosecutions are. I would maybe I would add a little bit of a nuance to what I said before, which is that I, you know different actors play different roles, right? So legislators have um, a certain motivation to send a message to their constituents about. In our, you know, in the case of the statutes, we're most concerned about being tough on terrorism, right? Um, I think prosecutors have a similar motivation, but they also like high profile cases. And they like a large number of cases, cases that are easy to win, right, with, very, with uh, statutes that give them a lot of flexibility. Um, in terms of how do we actually change the incentive system specifically for prosecutors, that's hard, but I liked what you said, Kate, about shaming. Um, I think that's a really um, important point. You know, when it comes to Selective prosecutions, we all know that suspect communities are most vulnerable. And the more that we have uh, you know, broad uh, buy-in from the general population that doesn't consider itself to be at risk for those prosecutions, um, and a lot of deference to uh, prosecutors saying, that, well, if they're throwing the label terrorism out there, they must be a really bad guy, right? The more that we have that deference, the more that we're going to see uh, a shift so that these are prosecutions of everybody and not just suspect communities. Um, so the more, that, the earlier that we can shame, <laughs> I think the more protection that we have against that. 
Yeah, I think it's, it's the thing you're driving to is this idea of political accountability, right? It's this notion of like, it, it is often posited as the solution for bad prosecution or bad law or bad lawmakers is, well, vote them out, vote them out. Um, and it is why I think people like Lawrence Lessig have started in one policy issue and moved to the mechanisms of legislative power and focusing on why doesn't, why isn't this responsive to the will of the people? Because I think that in, in, in all of these cases, you know, with some exception, you know, we, we all are sympathizing with them. And the first thing we should recognize is that we are biased and we are sympathizing with the technologists because we all identify ourselves in some degree as technologists. Um, but also that um, even if we do, the power of fear is just so powerful mm -hmm. for a legislator. I mean, I think it's still true. I think we have two um, copies of child pornography laws in the criminal code today. We have two different chapters that are both meant to address child pornography. And the reason why we have two and one has almost completely super, uh, superseded the other is that no one wants to pass a law removing child pornography laws from the books, right? Because it's like, what's the perception of that, right? And so, um, you know, this idea that there are, you know, it, it is all problems for which greater input, greater information should, in theory, help. But the most frustrating thing about all of this, and the thing that I, I think I'm personally most frustrated about in the realm of cybersecurity research in particular, has been there's this great push to isolate, to classify, to hide, or to punish people who are doing something as simple as trying to explain what these videos um, about you know, people who are uh, you know, agitating against the United States are actually saying and doing, which no one seems to understand in popular media, and yet the people who are trying to actually be those bridge figures, to borrow from one of Ethan's words, um, are being punished for it. I also, I also think there's, there's both an emotional and a, a tactical desire to control that motivates both the existence and enforcement of some of the laws. So um, you'll, you'll sometimes hear senators just in a frothing rage about these kids who think they can do whatever, but we're going to show them that actually we can control the hackers, we can, we can put them in jail. And um, there's a former member of the military who was talking to me and said that it's really important to have a broad computer laws so that you can intimidate people who are skillful hackers and make it more likely that they'll participate in, in uh, government hacking rather than doing it independently, which is just an egregious use of, uh, of the tremendous power that you have as a prosecutor or as a governing body. So we're going to take a final question. Um, this is actually along the same lines. Um, thinking back to the stories this morning from Star and Jeremy, um, the outcomes from those um, actually seem, compared to what could have happened, quite reasonable for the legal outcomes. But the impact that's really damaging is the time along the way that they had to experience, that they had to go through. Um, like, it was great to hear that Jeremy, for example, um, was quite comfortable with the settlement in the end, except for a few changes to it. Um, along the lines of what you're talking about, do you, do you have any ideas about we as individuals or the organizations that you are a part of? Uh, could intervene <laughs> to, per to prevent that kind of stuff from happening before. Man, the NSA is not happy about what you just said. question and perhaps the end of this microphone. Thinking about in, in cases where the legal outcome is not necessarily uh, a hideous or tragic one, but the process um, is a miserable and life-changing one, which I think we can all sort of acknowledge seems to be the case for these experiences. Any way we can think about uh, how to create an environment in which people who come under uh, this sort of litigation uh, are, are personally protected and supported in the process. Yeah, I think, I think the, the social support is a huge part of it. Um, and so actually, would be curious to hear, especially the students who are here, ideas for when a student comes under fire, how to support them. You know, sometimes people are advised not to talk too much about the litigation because things that they say can be used against them. Um, but at the same time, when you're under such an intense psychological toll, isolation can be really dangerous and harmful. Uh, so, so in a purely non-legal sense, just the idea of, of socially supporting one another, both as peers and as institutions, um, is a really important one. Uh, in terms also of, of what happens uh, when there has been um, 
a litigation under a ridiculously overbroad law or, or just one that's being asserted in an unjust way, um, even when there's a legal victory, the next steps can then be uh, use that legal victory to extend it into other jurisdictions. So now this victory that, that was only in Massachusetts, we're gonna get that around the country at some higher level courts. Uh, or if the judge uh, adopted a test that really makes sense and winds up being protective, get that written into the law or regulation so that it helps everybody. So um, I, I want to end this session uh, by thanking uh, these amazing folks, thanking uh, Kit and Andy and Shannon for uh, giving us this contribution and all this help and hope that um, you'll reach out to them for the rest of the day. Um, I have to say, activist lawyers warm my heart. Uh, <laughs>